you ever see Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? No. The cartoon was excellent, and the movies were even like more well refined. <laughs> Hey, welcome back to Screen Crush. I'm Ryan Airy, and I am here to talk to you about the history of the Ninja Turtles film. We're gonna deep dive into every Ninja Turtles movie in preparation for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem. This movie is going to be the seventh Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles theatrically released. Right, there's only been six other ones, but the Ninja Turtles have been around forever. Jason Statham's been in six Fast and Furious movies in just the last 10 years. I know, it's crazy, right? So since the indie comic first introduced the world to the Ninja Turtles in 1984, there have been a lot of adaptations, TV shows, video games, you name it. But so far, there have only been six theatrical films. Mutant Mayhem, an animated movie produced by Seth Rogen, Evan Goldberg, and James Weaver, will be the seventh big screen take on the Turtles when it comes out. That film is set in a new timeline that we have not seen before. It's not connected to any of the previous movies or TV shows, but this is not the first time the franchise has been rebooted. Depending on who you ask, the previous six films take place in either two or three different timelines. Depending on who you ask, like, like who the watcher? Actually, now you got me wishing that Jeffrey Wright did host a What If type show about the alternate Ninja Turtle dimension that would be radical. It'd be totally tubular, dude. It'd be bodacious. Cowabunga! Cowabunga! So let's go through each of the theatrical Ninja Turtles movies in chronological order, and we'll skip the straight-to-video movies like 2019's Batman vs. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles for now. Ninja Turtles. I'll also go through how these films adapted the comics in their own ways. Sometimes similar, sometimes very different. This could give us an idea of how Mutant Mayhem will be its own new thing, but also a part of the shared legacy of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Now, I'm assuming you guys already have some basic idea of what the Turtles even are, right? They've been such a pop culture phenomenon for pretty much four decades, so it's kind of a given. Just in case, though, the very basic premise that began with the comics, and pretty much the case for most adaptations, is this. Four baby turtles were mutated with a radioactive ooze that made them smarter and stronger. They grew up in the sewers of New York City and were raised by a rat named Splinter, who also taught them ninjutsu. The turtles are named Leonardo, Michelangelo, Donatello. They all make up the team with one more fellow, Raphael. He's the leader of the group, all mutated by the mutagen goop. Person? Sorry, 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 I got distracted. Oh, I get it. They're all named after famous characters from The Sopranos. What? No, dude, they're named after Renaissance artists, and they each have a weapon that they specialize in. Leonardo has katana, Raphael the sai, Donatello the bow, and Michelangelo the nunchucks. The turtles typically use their ninja skills to protect New York and sometimes the entire planet. Their arch nemesis is Shredder and the Foot Clan, and most adaptations also involve mutant and or alien villains like Bebop, Rocksteady, and Crank. Allies like April O'Neil and Vigilante Casey Jones are also usually part of the turtle story, especially April, who is typically a lab assistant or journalist of some kind. So it's a story that lends itself well to adaptation. It's got a strong core premise that can be tweaked in all sorts of little ways, just like the other pop culture icons like Batman or Superman. Even details about like where the turtles mutated, who named them, or even whether Splinter was originally a rat or not, they change from story to story. Now this flexibility in the canon can also make some of the movies feel very different from one another, especially since they adapt not just the original comic books, which were pretty dark and mature, but also the 1987 cartoon that really launched the franchise into the mainstream. Don't panic, Michelangelo! I'll set you free! That version was a Saturday morning cartoon primarily meant to sell as many toys as possible and was very different from what the Ninja Turtles creators Peter Laird and Kevin Eastman originally envisioned. The movies, in their own ways, take different elements from both the darker comics and the kid-friendly cartoon and combine them into something entirely new. So, let's start with the very first theatrical movie, The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which came out on March 30th, 1990. Directed by Stephen Barron and written by Todd W. Langan and Bobby Herbeck, the movie was fairly low budget, made for less than $14 million. But that didn't stop it from looking great, however, thanks to the turtles being built by Jim Henson's Creature Shop. It was actually one of the very last things Jim Henson worked on before he passed away, and it might be the biggest reason the movie was so successful. I mean, the turtles and Splinter look awesome in this. Henson even said they were the most advanced effects he'd ever worked with. Basically, the turtles were four guys in big green suits, but the heads were animatronic. This perfect combination allowed the turtles to move around realistically while also making their big, exaggerated faces look both lifelike and otherworldly, something that wouldn't quite work with human faces. Remember, this was before CGI was anywhere near looking realistic. Having actors inside the turtle suits also allowed the turtles to perform stunts and fight choreography, which you know is kind of important for the whole ninja part of the time. The actors and the stuntmen inside the suits were all relative unknowns. Except for Josh Pace, who played Raphael, the actors who voiced the Turtles were different from the guys inside the suits. Brian Tochi from Police Academy and Revenge of the Nerds voiced Leonardo. Robbie Rist, who played Cousin Oliver in the later seasons of The Brady Bunch, played Michelangelo, and Donatello was voiced by none other than 80s teen heartthrob, Corey Feldman. Do you like penicillin on your pizza? Splinter was voiced and controlled by Kevin Clash, who also puppeteered another iconic Jim Henson character, Elmo. Who's 
this? Oh, that's a picture of Elmo trying to scare Julia Roberts. <laughs> the human cast was also filled with mostly unknowns, including Judith Hogue as April, Elias Cotius as Casey Jones, and James Sato as the Shredder. The story, especially when compared to all the Turtles movies that would follow, is pretty low-key and simple. Modern-day New York is in the middle of a big crime wave, but nearly all the crimes are mysterious burglaries that can't be explained. That's because the thieves are actually ninjas, members of the Foot Clan, which Shredder has relocated from Japan to New York. He's gathering dozens of disaffected local teenagers, including very young pre-fame actors like Scott Wolf, Skeet Ulrich, and Sam Rockwell. Regular or mental? Some of these teens, after training with ninjutsu, are initiated into the Foot Clan. April O'Neil is a TV reporter and seemingly the only journalist interested in this case. And when she's attacked by the Foot, the Turtles come to her rescue. They actually come to her rescue twice, which gets them on Shredder's radar. Shredder retaliates by kidnapping Splinter, leaving the Turtles devastated. While crashing at April's place, which is above her father's antique store in the village, the Foot launch a huge attack. Raphael is seriously injured. April's place is burned down, and the Turtles only barely escape thanks to a last-minute intervention by Casey Jones. Casey is an ex NHL player turned vigilante and had only just met Raph and the two of them hit it off, literally. <laughs> Casey, April, and the Turtles escape to a farmhouse where Raph recovers and they train in preparation for another fight with the Foot. Remember, at this time, they don't know anything about these guys. They don't even know about the Shredder. Meanwhile, Danny, who is a Foot in training and the son of April's boss, befriends Splinter and inadvertently leads Casey to the Foot's headquarters. Casey rescues Splinter and there's a big epic battle between the Turtles and the Foot, which leads to a rooftop showdown with the Shredder. The Shredder proves too much for the Turtles and is about to kill Leonardo when Splinter comes to the rescue. Splinter reveals that Shredder is none other than Oroku Saki, the man who killed his master. Shredder, seeing the rat that scarred his face and forced him to wear a mask, loses his shit. He charges at Splinter and ends up in the back of a garbage truck. Then Casey kills him in cold blood. Splinter makes it funny and the movie ends with a great rap track called T-U-R-T-L-E Power by Partners in Crime. <laughs> This is one of the best rap songs where the lyrics explain the plot of the movie, up there with On Our Own and Ghostbusters 2. Shredder being crushed to death is pretty dark stuff, which is partly what makes the first Ninja Turtles movie so unique and interesting. It was made because the cartoon was so popular, but it's adapted from the early stories of the more mature comic book. The tone and personalities of the Turtles are somewhere in the middle, kind of hitting a perfect sweet spot. And because the movie was so low budget, it has a grittiness to it that none of the other film share. Now, there was another big budget movie called Masters of the Universe that adapted the He-Man cartoon, and it was a huge bomb. So Hollywood's major studios didn't want to touch another movie based on a popular cartoon. New Line Cinema distributed the film, but none of the big studios had anything to do with its production, which technically makes it an independent film. Thanks to a solid story, funny dialogue, great music, and Jim Henson's puppeteering, the movie was a huge hit when it was released in theaters. Making more than $200 million, it became the biggest box office hit of all time for an indie film, a record it held until the Blair Witch Project came along in 1999. So with all that money being made, it didn't take long for Hollywood to make a sequel. In fact, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, The Secret of the Ooze, came out less than a year after the first one. It was also given nearly twice the budget. It's dedicated to Jim Henson and was one of the first Jim Henson productions to come out after his untimely death. The New York locations of Jim Henson's Creature Shop is also used as April's apartment in Secret of the Ooze. You can see it in a scene with, of all people, Curb Your Enthusiasm, Susie Essman. Well, honey, if you cut back on the heavy aerobics and all that jumping and yelling. It's all right, Muriel. I find it disturbing. Despite the movies being so close together and the story being a direct sequel to the first film, Secret of the Ooze is a very different movie. There's no Casey Jones and the actress playing April was replaced by Paige Turco. Corey Feldman was arrested on drug possession charges in between films so the voice of Donatello was also replaced. The movie also loses its darker tone from the first film in order to appeal to more kids and their parents. But if the first movie was such a hit with kids, well, why, why'd they make it different? Because a bunch of stupid parents complained about it being too violent so they had to dumb it down on the next one. So this movie is like definitely more kid friendly. Like the turtles avoid using their weapons in nearly every fight. At one point Michelangelo even uses sausages instead of nunchucks. Combat conquers! And a new, younger sidekick was added to replace Casey Jones, a skilled martial artist and pizza delivery boy named Kino. Kino was played by Ernie Reyes Jr., who performed a lot of martial arts inside the Donatello suit in the first movie. The film story is also more kid-friendly sci-fi and closer to the cartoon. As the title suggests, it does reveal more backstory about the ooze. That's the mutagen slime that created the turtles. The backstory is still similar to the comics, but the lab that makes the ooze has its name slightly changed. In the comics, it's the Techno-Cosmic Research Institute, or TCRI. The cosmic is because 
because it's actually a front for an evil race of aliens. In the movie, however, there's no mention of aliens or interdimensional beings, so the lab is changed to TGRI with the cosmic being replaced by global. In the film, the turtles look for a new home since their previous layer was found and destroyed by the foot in the first film. They stumble on an old abandoned subway station and move there. Well, we prefer the term ooze, but yeah. It's like more like, it's just nicer. It, it, it rolls off the tongue cool. better, yeah. Meanwhile, it turns out that Shredder survived being crushed in a trash compactor and he and Tatsu are rebuilding the remnants of the foot. Sam Rockwell had moved on to bigger and better things, but one of the new recruits was a young Michael J. White. Shredder was also recast in this movie, this time played by Francois Chow, aka lost character Pierre Chang, aka Dr. Marvin Condal, aka Dr. Mark Woodman, aka Edgar Hallowax. One of April's co-workers is actually an undercover foot soldier and finds out about the ooze. Shredder kidnaps a TGRI scientist played by the late, great David Warner. Affirmative. Yes. You. Right on, my man. Shredder makes him use the ooze to create two mutants that can match the strength of the turtles. Obviously, these were meant to be the fan-favorite Rhino and Warthog duo from the cartoon, Rocksteady and Bebop. But the turtles creators Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird vetoed this because they thought they were stupid and annoying. <laughs> So instead, the movie made up two different mutant characters, Toka and Razor, a snapping turtle and a wolf, which were pretty much just as stupid and annoying. Yeah, stupid. So despite the ooze giving them strength, these guys didn't have the 15 years or so of growing up and training that the turtles had under Splinter. Yeah, babies. So Shredder's plan backfires, and working with David Warner, the turtles are able to change Toka and Razor back. Shredder drinks the last vial of ooze in existence, which somehow also mutates his armor and makes him into the Super Shredder. Now, it didn't seem to grow his brain, however, because Super Shredder's plan is basically to kill himself and hopefully take the turtles with him. I'm not so sure if this is, uh, structurally speaking, such a good time for your uh, buddies to drop in. The turtles survive, and the movie ends with Splinter making another funny. The movie had another rap song about the turtles, this one by Vanilla Ice, who was at the height of his fame. Unlike the first movie rap, though, Vanilla Ice performs ninja rap in the actual movie. <laughs> Secret of the Ooze made almost $80 million at the box office, less than half of the first film. So, while it made its money back and then some, it was a bit of a disappointment. That didn't stop them from making a third movie in 1993, which means that the original TMNT trilogy came out within a span of just three years. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3 kept the second film's Paige Turco as April and brought back the first movie's Elias Cotillas as Casey Jones. Corey Feldman was also back as Donatello, but Raphael was replaced by Tim Kelleher. This means that only two voice actors for Leonardo and Michelangelo remained the same all throughout the trilogy. Also gone were Shredder, Tatsu, and The Foot. Instead, this film goes in a completely different direction with the Turtles traveling back in time to feudal Japan. April buys gifts for the Turtles at a flea market like a lamp for Michelangelo and a fedora for Raphael. Oh my god, did you see Brian's hat, Vincent? Oh f Ha 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 ha. What the hell? She gives Splinter an ancient Japanese scepter, but while she's holding it, she's accidentally transported back in time and swaps places with a young Japanese prince named Kenshin. The turtles use the scepter to go back in time and rescue April and are swapped with four 17th century honor guards. Casey Jones babysits these guys in a B-plot that pretty much goes nowhere. Let's play a little hockey. Okay. Meanwhile, in feudal Japan, the turtles fight Kenshin's father, the evil Lord Norinaga, and they rescue April. Elias Cotillas also plays a character in the past, but he's not even like an ancestor of Casey Jones or anything like that. He's just kind of there, and just like in the first movie, he kills the final bad guy in cold blood. And that's about it. The movie really doesn't have much to offer, despite a cool premise of sending the turtles back to ancient Japan. Also, the studio used someone other than Jim Henson's Creature Shop for the turtles' costumes, and it shows. They look less like the turtles from the first movie, and more like cheap imitations you take photos of on Hollywood Boulevard. Critics hated it, and it made even less money than the second film. Another sequel was considered, including a script called The Foot Walks Again, and another called The Next Mutation. Neither were made, however, though an unrelated live-action TV series called The Next Mutation was made a few years later. That used the same sewer layer as the movies, but it's not clear if it was an actual continuation of that timeline. It wasn't until 2007 when a fourth Ninja Turtles movie hit theaters, and this one was animated. The film was simply called TMNT. I guess that's better than calling it the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. You know, like how they made the Wolverine, the Predator, the Batman. The Bart. So TMNT was originally announced in 2000 with the legendary John Woo set to direct. Unfortunately, that movie never came to pass, which is why what we ended up with didn't have any slow motion shots of Splinter dual wielding pistols as a flock of doves flies by. Instead, the film was written and directed by Kevin Monroe. Because it was animated, the movie was able to show more elaborate martial arts, as well as the more fantastical side of the turtles without breaking the budget. The main bad guy is an immortal warlord who opens a portal to another dimension, unleashing 13 ancient monsters onto New York City. Now, 
Now the cast has some bigger names in the previous films, probably because it's cheaper and easier to get A-listers when it's just voiceover work. Patrick Stewart plays the evil warlord, Sarah Michelle Gellar was April, and Casey Jones was played by Chris Evans, who was already the Human Torch but wasn't yet Captain America. The film also featured Zi Yi Zhang as Karai, a high-ranking Foot Clan member from the comics, and Lawrence Fishburne as the narrator. The cast also had some big names from the voiceover world like John DiMaggio and Kevin Michael Richardson, and Raphael was played by Nolan North, who's probably best known as Nathan Drake from the Uncharted games. Yeah, good luck, Belle. I mean, that's almost <laughs> impossible to... Oh, you did it. Nice. Now, it's a little unclear whether this movie is a direct sequel to the original trilogy or if it's its own standalone film. Peter Laird says that it's standalone, but the writer-director says that it's a sequel, and there's really nothing that contradicts that. The Turtles are a little older than they were in the first three films, and the story makes it clear that they had previously defeated the Shredder. In fact, part of the film's story is about how the Turtles seem to have lost their purpose now that the city was safe. Just like Ray and Winston in Ghostbusters 2, Michelangelo works as a birthday party entertainer. We got gone! We got TMNT did okay at the box office, making nearly $100 million, but the studio eventually decided to not make a follow-up. Writer-director Kevin Monroe said that he planned to bring back Shredder in a sequel that was adapted from the comics City at War arc. A disillusioned Michelangelo would join the Foot Clan, which could have been really cool, and the third planned film in this animated trilogy would have finally introduced the Technodrome. But those movies never materialized, and the timeline that began with the 1990 movie finally came to an end. It would be another seven years before we got our next theatrical Turtles movie, a complete reboot produced by none other than Michael Bay. I miss you more than Michael Bay missed the mark. Now Nickelodeon bought the full rights to the Ninja Turtles from Eastman and Laird in 2009 and quickly brought on Michael Bay to produce a new reboot film. Clearly they were hoping for the same sort of success that Bay brought to the Transformers IP. And the new film definitely has that sort of epic explosion-y feel. It had a bigger budget than the first four Turtle films combined. In 2012, Bay said that the title would be shortened to just Ninja Turtles and that they wouldn't be mutants but actually aliens from a planet of turtles. <laughs> You're sticking paws off me, you damn dirty turtle. Now, if you don't remember, the fan outrage hearing this news was huge. Shortening the title does make sense and would help separate the movie from the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but making them aliens was a step too far. Robbie Rist, the original voice of Mikey in the 90s films, even accused Michael Bay of sodomizing the franchise, which... bit much. Buster! In response to the backlash, the movie was retooled to be closer to the mutant Earthborn Turtles that we all know and love. The film came out with the full title Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles in 2014. Well, when you put it like that, it sounds ridiculous. It was directed by Jonathan Liebsman, who previously made Battle Los Angeles and Wrath of the Titans. Unlike the original trilogy, which used Jim Henson practical effects, the new movie used motion capture and CGI and gave a completely new look to the turtles. The turtles were bigger, brawnier, and grimier. A lot of people thought they were ugly and kind of disgusting, but honestly, considering they're mutant turtles that grew up in the sewer, it's a logical choice. The movie also gave each turtle a more distinctive look. Donatello, typically the nerd of the group, had glasses. They were even taped up in the middle. Raphael was bulkier and sported a do-rag, along with the standard bandana. Mikey, traditionally the younger of the turtles, was shorter than the rest. Just like previous films, the turtles were mostly voiced and performed by unknowns and lesser known actors. The exception was Leonardo, who was voiced by Johnny Knoxville, who didn't do any of his own stunts despite doing more dangerous work in the Jackass films. <laughs> Splinter was voiced by TV star Tony Shalhoub and performed by Danny Woodburn, perhaps best known as Mickey on Seinfeld. <laughs> Previous Michael Bay collaborator Megan Fox was cast as April O'Neil, who is earlier in her journalism career than she was in the previous films. She's joined by Will Arnett as Vern Fenwick, a character that didn't originate in the comics, but rather in the 1987 cartoon. Oh. Vern and April's boss is Whoopi Goldberg, who is playing a feminized version of Vern Thompson, another original cartoon character who inspired this unflattering action figure. The Shredder is played by Tahuro Masamune, while William Fitcher plays the film's other main antagonist, evil CEO Eric Sachs. Now, if that name sounds familiar, it's because it's very clearly an Americanized version of Aruku Saki. It was likely that the film originally had a twist where Fitcher was actually Shredder the whole time. The whole time? The whole time? You would... The whole time? Just like Liam Neeson as Ra's al Ghul in Batman Begins. In the final version, he and Shredder are two completely different characters. Now, Shredder has a much more advanced super suit in this film when compared to the original. In fact, the whole movie is on a much bigger scale. That isn't surprising, though, considering Michael Bay's involvement and the general evolution of what we expect from Hollywood blockbusters these days. The film still involves a crime wave and the Foot Clan, but now Shredder is attacking the entire city with aerosolized mutagen. Instead of a straightforward ninja fight in the sewers, there's 
there's an epic chase involving a truck crashing down a mountain. Instead of the turtles fighting Shredder on a roof, the turtles, well, they still fight Shredder on a roof. But it's much more intense and ends with a giant antenna plummeting off the building. Other differences between this bigger version of the turtles involve changes to their backstory. In this version of the story, April's dad helped to create the ooze alongside Eric Sachs, a protege of the Shredder, hoping that it could be used to cure diseases. When he finds out that Eric's intentions are evil, He's killed, and his lab is burned down. It was actually April, as a young child, who named the turtles. Leonardo, Raphael, Michelangelo, and Donatello. She rescues them and Splinter when the lab is destroyed, leaving them in a sewer. Like typical Michael Bay films, the movie had some decent set pieces, and the CGI wasn't really that bad, but it suffered from a script seemingly written by a five-year-old. I want the cars to drive fast and then some of them explode. Many people also complained that the Turtles didn't have enough screen time, barely appearing in the first hour of the film. Instead, a lot of focus was on Megan Fox and, for some reason, Will Arnett. And I'm not afraid to make mistakes. Or have you forgotten this little bit? Damn it! However, it did pretty okay at the box office, especially considering considering that it was going up against the original Guardians of the Galaxy and earned $493 million worldwide. That was enough for it to get a direct sequel, which it did two years later with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Out of the Shadows. Out of the Shadows was helmed by Earth to Echo director Dave Green and cost $135 million to make. For whatever reason, half the characters were recast. Johnny Knoxville was not asked to return, and Leonardo was voiced by Pete Plosek instead. Tyler Perry appears as Dr. Baxter Stockman, a character originally from the comics who, in several versions of the story, became Baxter the Fly. Baxter was played by Kate Todd Freeman in a blink and you miss it supporting role in the last movie. Two high-ranking members of the foot were also recast. Brian T replaced Tohuru Masumun as Shredder and Emine Noji was replaced with Brittany Ishibashi for the role of Karai. You might know Ishibashi best as Nico's mom from Marvel's The Runaways and William Fichter's Eric Sachs doesn't show up at all. Now it seems like the producers really wanted to win over the fans by leaning way more into the lore of Ninja Turtles with this movie, especially the cartoon. Casey Jones is back, this time played by Arrow's Stephen Amell. Stacy Mo. Oh. <laughs> Casey Jones. We see the turtle van, which we only got a glimpse of at the end of the last movie. This incarnation is a souped up garbage truck. The turtles are clearly going through their tank phase, a lot like Christian Bale and Batman Begins. Oh, the tumbler? Oh, you wouldn't be interested in that. And to the delight of many, the sixth theatrical Ninja Turtles film finally introduces Bebop and Rocksteady, played by Gareth Anthony Williams and WWE wrestler Sheamus. As in the cartoon, they are two criminal punks merged with the DNA of a warthog and a meerkat. Can we keep him? Yes, of course we can keep him. I mean, a warthog and a rhinoceros. They aren't the only popular characters making their cinematic debuts either. This movie also gives us Krang for the first time, the brain-shaped alien warlord, as well as his android bodysuit. He is voiced by Brad Garrett best known as Robert on Everybody Loves Raymond. Everybody loves Shredder. We also finally get an epic CGI version of the Technodrome, the badass mobile base that Krang uses. It's basically a giant round tank with a big evil eyeball on top. And in the original NES game, it was impossible to get through, but I did it. I beat the Technodrome. You see that world? You see what I just did? Did you see the game I just beat? The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? This movie had everything that Turtles fans had wanted to see since the 90s, but unfortunately it just fell flat. Instead of a weirdo loner, Casey Jones is just some jock cop who likes hockey. Shredder breaks out of jail and teams up with Krang for no reason whatsoever. Megan Fox's April is somehow sexualized and reduced to an even more of a plot device than she was in the first film. The Turtles have a really weird arc too. To keep their existence hidden from the public, Will Arnett's Vern takes credit for defeating Shredder in the first film, which is actually a pretty fun move for the character. But the Turtles are resentful and tired of hiding. This is similar to the other Part 2 storyline in 1991. Unlike that sequel, when they save the city and the world, again at the end of the movie, instead of their arc completing and the public accepting them, they make a weird arrangement with Laura Lenny's chief of police. Normal. What fun is that? The NYPD know about them now, and they won't arrest them, but they still have to hide in the shadows from everyone else. Anyways, the movie made about half as much box office as the first film. The weak story just didn't grab movie audiences. Despite the main cast being signed on for three films, a third one was never made. However, we will soon have a seventh theatrical film, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem. It will be directed by Jeff Rowe, who made The Mitchells vs. The Machines. It's got a really cool animation style that resembles sketchbook drawings, harkening back to its comic origins. The Turtles are once again voiced by unknown 
unknowns, but for the first time, they're being played by actual teenagers. Between the casting and the involvement of Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg, who wrote Superbad, I think we're going to see the most teenage version of the characters yet. The first trilogy played up their 80s, 90s surfer dude aspects, while the newer films made them angsty and horny. Mutant Mayhem looks to focus on more of the childlike aspects of still being a teenager, skewing them closer to younger audiences. April is also being portrayed as younger in this film, which makes the age difference between her and the Turtles a little less weird. She's being played by the Bears, Io Itaberry. Jackie Chan is playing Splinter, and the movie seems to be bringing back a lot of fan-favorite characters from the cartoon. What we do in the Shadows star, Natasia Dimitru, is Wingnut, Rose Byrne is Leatherhead, Ice Cube is Superfly, Host Malone is Ray Filet, Hannibal Burris is Genghis the Frog, and Paul Rudd is Mondo Gecko. Slap it to bass. That sounded like Borat. Yeah. This time, Baxter Stockman will be played by Giancarlo Esposito, and Bebop and Rocksteady will be voiced by Seth Rogen and John Cena. Amazingly, the score is by Oscar winner and Nine Inch Nails member Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross, which should be very interesting. Seth Rogen says that the soundtrack will be like a Tony Hawk game, so we can probably expect a lot of pop punk. This works well with the Turtles being kids tone of the film. And really, that's what's so great about the Ninja Turtles and the six previous films we've had so far. Just as with other comic book heroes like Batman and Spider-Man, the Turtles are malleable. They can start in smaller stories involving street crime or more mystical ones involving ancient Japanese orders. It's a shame that the big, loud Michael Bay interpretation of the turtles didn't quite work. You might prefer the gritty, low-key take on the characters, but it's also cool to see them fighting giant alien mechs and saving the entire world from monsters. It's a good thing, though, that each version of the Ninja Turtles is different from the one before. Variety is the spice of life. Exactly, Doug. High five. Cowabunga! But at the end of the day, what we really want is a good story. So hopefully Mutant Mayhem hooks us with well-rounded characters and invests us in a script where we actually care about what's going to happen next. Like with Across the Spider-Verse. Maybe this will launch a whole new trilogy with this version of the Turtles. Gosh. I do hope there's more of them. And if Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross give us this generation's version of the ninja rap, I am all here for it. Go ninja, go ninja, go. Go ninja, go ninja, go. Go, 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 go. So guys, what was your very first Ninja Turtles movie? Do you prefer the cartoon? Let me know everything down in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe, smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.